Just a few thoughts to get started. When we look at the economics of forage production, and, and we do think that forages are the basis of the dairy and beef industry, there's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, one is that the fixed costs are high. Well, they're high for all production, but uh, you have a land charge, which is significant, and we have a machinery charge, which is really significant and increased greatly. Uh, I remember a few years ago, my brother who was, was farming then yet uh, bought a new tractor and he told me how much it costs. And I said, well, is that going to make you an extra $150 per acre? And then he wasn't so enthused about talking about the new tractor anymore. Um, I mean, it, it's just the life that we live in. Those costs have really increased. In addition, the variable costs uh, don't change that much. Uh, you can save a little bit on seed cost if you're unless you're planting above the recommended seeding rate, but buying the cheaper seed is, we think, uh, really a loss in yield potential, and you're only gonna save a few bucks per acre. Fertilizer costs, uh, we should all get whatever we can from manure. We should recycle as much as we can, but uh, the additional cost to get good yield is, is not that great. And then mainly it comes down to harvesting costs. And uh, we've looked at this with uh, ourselves and a number of our engineers, and really harvesting costs aren't much different whether you have a high yield or a low yield. You know, you think about it, it takes about the same amount of time to mow a one ton yield as it does a two or a three ton yield. It takes about the same amount of time to rake them. Uh, the only Differences are our engineers tell us if we're harvesting twice as much, it takes 15% more energy, 15, one, five. And of course you have a few more trips to the barn as you're hauling more hay or silage off the field. So harvesting costs don't really change that much with yield. And what that means then is, is that the higher your yield, the uh, greater your return per acre. Here is some data that we collected a number of years ago, and actually when hay prices were $100 instead of $150 or $200. But um, we measured yields on farmers' fields. We recorded all of the inputs and then recorded the machinery that they used and depreciated that. And what you see is that there's a pretty good relationship that as uh, yield went up, the return per acre went up. And, and so I would encourage you to think about all that. Uh, if you can uh, increase your yield, you can increase your return per acre and, 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 and reduce the cost of any forage that you're feeding. With that in mind, uh, one additional thought uh, really is that uh, we need quality forage for dairy cattle. And uh, what this graph shows is alfalfa that was harvested at four stages of maturity. And then we fed it with either 20% concentrate, 37 or 54. Of course, the 54 was not sustainable, but we could for a few weeks in the trial. What, what I think is important out of this graph is that at every quality of forage, when we fed more grain, we did increase the milk production a little bit. But what I want you to notice is that when alfalfa was harvested at early bloom, whether if we fed even 54% concentrate, we could not get as much milk as if we had harvested that alfalfa at the bud stage and fed 20% concentrate. You cannot make up for low quality forage. And um, I know many of you are working with primarily grass hay and, and that's fine, but the same comment uh, is true even more so that if you let it get too mature, you're really going to hurt your ability to produce milk and that cannot be overcome. So we need to think about quality forage. Um, the other thing <clears throat> that I wanted to just throw out here, well, I see I got a metric slide in here, I'm sorry, we could cut these in half then. Uh, when I look at the difference in yield of grass varieties from my trials, the difference between the lowest yielding variety and the highest yielding variety in the same trial planted side by side and treated the same. Uh, again, uh, what we see is if you look at orchard grass, tall fescue, smooth brome, or timothy, 
Uh, the difference here is about eight metric tons per hectare, which is about four English tons or American tons per acre. The difference between the best and the worst varieties in the same trial. So that's annually. So again, I would say, you know, can you afford an extra 50 cents or a dollar for a pound of seed to get an extra, even if this is, you think high, an extra ton or two of hay seems like a good investment. With ryegrass, and some of you are growing ryegrass now, the difference in varieties is, well, it was almost 14 metric tons, but that'd be about seven English tons per acre. The important thing is to get rust resistance. The important thing is to get uh, a few other traits that you need in your locale. And uh, what we are seeing here is Italian ryegrass can be a good crop if you have a good variety. But if you choose the cheap seed, you're gonna get what you paid for. So I do think uh, it really is important to pay attention to selecting the best variety you can get. and. Frankly, the best variety with the most disease resistance of grasses or alfalfa or clovers is going to perform far better for you in your fields. The, the other comment that I want to make then is to consider that uh, we need to think about cutting when it's high quality. One of the considerations is that Alfalfa is the highest quality when you cut it. And as we're going through the preservation process, either hay making or silage making or baleage, what we're trying to do is to minimize the yield and quality loss. So it's highest when we cut it. So the crucial thing is to cut when it is the high quality that we want or perhaps a tad above, so that when we have a little loss, it's still the kind of quality that we want to feed to our milking dairy cows. This graph shows that um, alfalfa and actually grasses on first cutting will increase in fiber by four tenths of a point a day. And they will increase, decrease in fiber digestibility by four tenths of a point a day. So every two and a half days you wait to cut that grass in the spring, you have 1% more fiber and 1% and of that is 1% less digestibility of the forage. Forage quality changes on a daily basis. And uh, if you really want quality, you have to cut when it's high quality. Uh, if, and, and one of the things that I think that we get a little bit too concerned about is fear of rain. Oh, it might rain tomorrow, so I'm not gonna cut today, which means I'm gonna wait two or three or four days. And therefore, you're going to have more fiber and less digestibility. Our recommendation for cutting grass is to cut at the boot stage, like you see in the far left slide, on first cutting. I would say that if you see heads, you're really a little bit late. You've got too much stem. It's okay maybe for beef cattle, for heifers, but it's not going to give you the kind of milk production that we would like to see. Uh, so we're talking about boot stage, and this is true whether it's a small grain, whether it's ryegrass, orchard grass, tall fescue. And if we're cutting at this stage, if we have a legume in there, a clover or an alfalfa, uh, they're usually at about the right stage to cut. We can tolerate a little bit of flowering in the clover, but we'd like the alfalfa at the bud stage. And then remember the nice thing about harvesting grasses is on second and later cuttings, uh, except for the rye grass, you'll have primarily leaves. So uh, really I would suggest coming in at about 30 days and cutting because um, that's when the bulk of your tonnage has occurred. Beyond that, you're going to get more leaf disease and yield and so on. Uh, the important thing is to cut the grasses at about a four inch height, uh, except for the rye grass so that they will have good root reserves in the base and come back quickly for you. While you're talking about that, uh, as far as Italian ryegrass, what cutting height do you prefer? Well, Italian ryegrass can, uh, stores its carbohydrates in the roots. So the advantage of that has always been that it can be gray short, mowed short, no problem. So I would go in the two to three inch range for Italian ryegrass, two inches probably. 
four inches for orchard, tall fescue, meadow fescue. Great, thank you. Good question. All right, so, so assuming that we've started with a high quality because we cut at the right time, the next thing that we want to do is we want to minimize the respiratory losses. And there the concept is that uh, what we have is that that plant has sugars. Um, if it's grasses, it has fructosans in it, which are long chains of sugars. If you got legumes, you have some starch in there. Um, and uh, you would like to preserve as much of that as you can for the animals you're feeding because it's 100% digestible. Uh, let me just kind of ask here, um, how many in the audience are making uh, haylage, chopping it and putting it in a bunker or two? I think pretty much everybody. Is anybody making baleage, wrap bales? Uh, we have one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so we always think about how long does it take to get it dry? <coughs> and, uh, and in fact, let me come back and ask now, since everybody's making haylage or silage, presumably on first cutting, um, how many are trying to put it up drier than 60% moisture? At least half. How many are doing in the 60 to 65? The others. Okay. Nobody above 65. That's good. <laughs> but um, what I'm going to show you is that uh, what we're looking at then is really the faster we can get it dried down to that 60% moisture, the faster that we can shut off respiration and the more starch and sugars that we can leave for the animals that we are trying to feed. Um, and the, the best way of doing this is to put the forage into a wide swath, as we show here on the right. Dan, I, one of the things that, as I've looked at it, <clears throat> I've not found any real consistent information about when that plant is basically dead and the respiration basically shuts off. There's conflicting data. What do you, what do you think about that? What are we shooting well, at? So, so respiration occurs in relationship to the moisture content and there's not an on off switch it gradually declines uh, the data would actually suggest that some respiration is is measurable as low as 40 percent moisture and I, that's probably what you're referring to okay yeah um i am saying 60 percent is when 80 or 90 percent of the respiration is shut down okay so I, I, our numbers kind of agree. I'm just saying we, we're not gonna be, we wanna shut off the fastest respiration. We probably are not gonna shut off all of it in the field. Okay. And, uh, and so my point would be that our, our, what we're trying to do is lose that first 15% moisture as quickly as possible. Now, um, one of the things that is really important to consider is that a lot of us uh, condition our grass or alfalfa or clover hay and then we put it immediately into a windrow. Uh, we really have gone back and looked at the data. We've done a lot of further studies and there are studies out of New York on this too as many of you are aware and clearly <coughs> wide swath is important. I think what we kind of missed and sort of made a mistake on was uh, if you think about it i don't have a picture of the people there right now but i don't know how many of you are as old as i am and uh, we used to before we had conditioners you would cut with a sickle bar mower and it would fall over behind the mower and be laid out at a hundred percent of your cut area when we went to conditioners a lot of people thought that that could uh, that we could then put it immediately into a windrow and maybe save some raking. There's a couple reasons why that's wrong now, but, uh, but actually the concept was totally wrong. Always remember that a wide swath is for drying the leaves, conditioning is for drying the stems. The two are totally different processes. 
We want a wide swath so we're intercepting more sunlight. We want a wide swath so the stomates stay open and the water will come out of the leaves because they close when we put them in the dark. And, um, you know, and then I guess let me just throw out here. I always think about how we kind of got off on the wrong track. I don't know how many of you have a clothesline at home, but when you or somebody in your family takes a shirt and goes out and hangs it up on the clothesline, you hang it in a single layer, uh, you let it, the sun hit it as much as you can, the wind blow on it a little bit. And if somebody in your family were to take that shirt and bend it four or five times and throw it in a pile on the ground and then complain because it didn't dry, you'd probably have something to say to them. But that's what a lot of people have been doing with hay. So a, a wide swath is the single most important factor for drying for silage. I'll just say that unequivocally. More important than conditioning, more important than anything else. Um, we have, when we've been making wide swaths, been able to cut our forage in the morning and about 70% of the time put it up as, at 60% moisture around supper time. Uh, obviously nothing works all the time, but the point would be we're getting hay up 70% of the time the same day we cut it. What do you that think? won't work if you got to milk your cows or something, but uh, for operations that can plan for that, we can do that quite a bit of the time. When we put hay into a windrow, what you see is like this, where the surface dries, and if you come back the next morning and you lift up that windrow, the underside inside that windrow is just as green as when you cut it. So that has respired all night. It has broken down sugars, fructosan, starches, whatever, and you have lost quality, you have lost dry matter. Uh, so it is crucial really to spread that out. This also, I would say, is why um, some of you may have heard about cutting in the afternoon, there's a little bit more starch and sugar, and that's true. In fact, even Laval at, up in Quebec pointed that out. However, if you cut in the afternoon and it doesn't get down to 60% moisture by nightfall, you'll start with more sugar, but you'll lose more sugar overnight and you'll actually add up, end up at the same point as a morning cutting, except you've added about half a day to the drying time and increased your risk of rain. So um, it works well in the Western United States where they can mow at three in the afternoon and with 20% humidity be down to 60% moisture by nightfall. Does not work so well east of the Mississippi. Uh, again, just a thought, uh, what we're looking at, part of the reason we want a wide swath is that that plant has holes in the leaves, those stomates that you see there on the bottom, stoma. stoma. Um, those open during the day and let air into the leaf, they let water out to cool the leaf, and they close at night. So when you uh, put them into a windrow immediately, two things happen. The first thing is the stoma closed because they're in the dark and then your leaf is between two waxy layers with no holes in it. If you lay it in a wide swath, they stay open and you uh, can have moisture uh, come out through those holes. The other thing is I have measured the humidity inside a windrow and within 15 to 20 minutes, the humidity inside the windrow is up to 95%. And I think you can appreciate that nine, when we're at 95% humidity, we have even less drying than the 60 or 70 that you might have in the air. So a wide swath is crucial. Uh, do consider then if we look at the drying of the sequence of forages, when you cut your grass, it's going to be something around 75, 78, maybe percent moisture, possibly as high as 80. Uh, and uh, that moisture loss can occur entirely from the stomatal openings. To get it down to 60, to make it appropriate for um, ensiling or baling. And then if we want to go drier to make hay is when we really need the conditioning. The respiration is a breakdown of starch and sugar. It can be two to eight percent. I'm going to suggest that uh, for most of you, it's probably in the two to 4% range. 
Now, one of the things that uh, we did a study this past summer looking at rake types in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Minnesota, and I just want to point out to you that when we looked at, and this was alfalfa, but we get a similar response with grasses, that the non-fibrous carbohydrate, which is starch and sugars, is responsible for about 60% of the change in forage quality. So if you can shut down respiration fast, if you can get it in the bunker or wrapped bale faster, not only do you reduce the risk of rain, but you're putting up a higher quality forage. Now, when I look at these costs, and I'll just take a 4% uh, starch and sugar loss, a 4% dry matter loss, if right now in the Midwest, uh, our hay is worth uh, dairy quality hay, 181 or $2 a ton. 4% loss is $9.56 per ton. That's just the dry matter that you lost. Now, if we look at the quality loss from that starch and sugar, if we had cut that hay, and this would be alfalfa at around 40%, or, and I'll come back and give you some numbers for grasses, but you're going to increase the fiber about 3 or 4%, a little less than 4 because of the starch and sugar loss. That difference in alfalfa in the Midwest is $57 a ton. So a person who is doing this is, is losing something around 60 or $70 a ton if they put it into a windrow rather than a wide swath. Now we'd see the same kind of thing here as we're looking at grass hay. Uh, we'd look hopefully to put it up something around 50% NDF. Um, again, you're going to increase the fiber content about 3% if you uh, lose 4% of the starch and sugar and you're going to reduce the ability of that forage to support milk production. One of the other things about, uh, I'll just mention, is if we make a wide swath, we get high quality forage. We get increased yield because we don't lose the starch and sugar as much. But also we tend to increase the yield of next cutting. Uh, and that's more true with alfalfa than it is with the grasses, uh, but it would also be true with clovers. A uh, study that we've done with alfalfa research, if you uh, look at the picture on the left, that was driven over five days after it was mowed. The picture on the right was not. Uh, what we are seeing, and I actually repeated this study at the, out here with field equipment, uh, last year and, and a couple years before that. If we uh, drive over a field, we were actually using a 10 foot mower conditioner versus 13 and looking at the difference. And what we showed was that we got an extra half ton of hay per acre per year by going to the wider cutter bar and having less wheel traffic on the field. Uh, the other thing to think about in all of this process is that uh, really we're not harvesting tonnage, we should be harvesting leaves. And uh, again, from this same study with the four rake types, when I look at leaf percentage, a relative forage quality you may or may not be familiar with, it's, it's an index of uh, digestible fiber intake and 150 and higher is considered to be dairy quality feed but 70% of the difference in relative forage quality of alfalfa was due to leaf percentage. The leaves are high in quality, as I show there, about 15 or 20% NDF, and that's true with grasses. And the stems then are, are higher yet. Um, so we do want to try to preserve the leaves through the harvesting process. In some ways, it's a little bit easier if you're making mainly grass hay than if you're making alfalfa. But in every case, we should think that every time we move the hay in the field, we are losing some dry matter. Every bit of dry matter that we lose is the high quality portion, and we're concentrating the stems that we have in that forage. So we want to dry hay with as, as little action as possible. Let me kind of go down and think a little bit about raking, tedding, and merging. Um, I think tedding is a good process for grass. 
Um, I guess you would need to know for haylage or baleage, it may not be necessary. I would simply uh, mow it and rake the grass once into a windrow and hopefully you can get it in that 60-ish percent moisture range and bale it. But you can see what tedding does to uh, alfalfa. Look at those leaves flying up above and that come down. So we do not recommend tedding for alfalfa, only for grasses. Uh, uh, just wanted to comment here. Uh, this is part of this study that we did this summer. We had four rake types, a parallel bar or basket rake, a wheel rake like you see on the left, a rotary rake, and then a merger. And what we're looking at was all the field was cut at the same time. We're following each one through looking at ash content. Um, I'll have more data on that as the next year, as we get this more of that summarized over the next year. But I do have a, a few uh, little food for thought, uh, what we expect to see in our thinking. First is, is that uh, parallel bar maybe gives us the tightest windrow, slowest drying, and uh, is problematic in terms of incorporating dirt and stones into the hay, especially if your field isn't perfectly level like this one is. If there are any ridges, it really drags the tine across it. The other thing is that the difference in between the remainder of them has an awful lot to do with adjustment. And mostly what I see is most farmers are not adjusting their rates for the type of forage they're harvesting. And do I need to do something? No. Nope. You... We can see. Okay, a bar just came down. Told me I needed to resume something, but I'll ignore it then. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a little bit like this spider hanging over your head, you know, you never quite know what you should do. But anyway, um, the main consideration with raking is always to have the tines touch the ground as little as possible. When we make a wide swath, a rotary rake and a, a, a merger can pick up the hay without touching the ground, and so there's little stone in, or, and dirt incorporation. The wheel rake uh, must, uh, of course, is ground driven. So we want the minimum contact possible to turn the wheels, but we, we do need to have some contact there. I will say that the machinery companies tell me that their biggest expense with rakes is replacing bent and broken teeth, which means that, on, that all of those machines that were bent and broken teeth occurred were set a little bit too deep. So I, I do encourage you to think about how many of the audience has any of the wheel rakes? What do you guys use? Road rake? It's like everybody's oh. Okay, I'm not surprised. Rotary is a good type of rake. Uh, and uh, we see wheel rakes more in the hay making, but they don't work so good for wetter hay or silage. And so then we tend to move to other types of rakes and, and the, the rotary rake is, is a good one. Again, you know, it's hydraulic or PTO driven depending on your model. So you can set it so the teach, teeth never touch the ground. The other thing that I like about it is um, in some ways it can be a little bit better even in a merger in terms of the pickup. Depending on how your mower is adjusted, some of that uh, forage that comes out may lay pretty straight with the direction of travel. I think this is less of a problem with grass than with alfalfa, but if it lays straight with the direction of travel, then as the pickup tines of a merger come and go straight forward, they will leave some strands in the field versus a rotary, which tends to be a little bit more on the diagonal will pick up hay uh, irregardless of the direction that it is laying in the field. So that's a good choice. I uh, do think that uh, we do want to really pay attention to uh, machine adjustments and, and particularly with a rotary rake. Uh, there's a lot of adjustment of rotary speed versus ground speed. And uh, I know we all want to go fast, but uh, you might think about that. You might look at the leaf loss that you're having as you go. In this case, this person was leaving an awful lot of alfalfa in the field and, and it was a high quality field. 
Here's an example of the wind rows of uh, different types of rakes. I see the uh, animation doesn't work with the system. But you could, can you see my cursor? Well, the, the animation should work if you put it in presentation mode. This oh, that's right, but, yeah. but then we can't get a full screen, so well, I'm, that's all right. Well, you could try it for this one if you want, it's up to you. Yep. I don't need it. So anyway, the point would be on the far left is a wind row made by a parallel bar or basket rake. And, and you can see that that is much ropier, much tighter than either of the other two wind rows. And so um, we are concerned about the drying potential of this. Again, for haylage, less different than hay, but I'm going to presume that both of you make some of each. Uh, when I'm looking at evaluating rakes, you want a rake that uh, as on actually either of the left two, you would like a loose wind row, you would like a uniform wind row. You don't want it to be bunchy. And uh, a little bit of this is adjustment of the machine. A little bit of this is uh, machine design. So it's one of the things you might evaluate when you're buying new machines. Let's talk a little bit about uh, hay and haylage presentation. I should have changed the title a little bit. Uh, as we're thinking about this, we want, um, we want to inhibit mold growth, either in the silo or in the bales, and baleage is where this becomes crucial. Uh, molds grow at anything, well, I say 20 to 35 here, but actually anything up to about 70% moisture. They consume nutrients. They respire, so, and I would encourage all of you to think, either in your bunkers or in your hay bales, when you have heating, that's a loss of energy. That's energy that you could be feeding your cattle. Instead, it's being given off to the air. Uh, it can also cause hay fires, uh, and that's uh, a more dramatic uh, part of the respiratory process. The molds will uh, produce mycotoxins sometimes. Uh, generally, in hay bales, we see like on the lower right here, a white mold, which is generally penicillin and not too much of a problem. If you see colored molds of any kind, I would, in either the hay or the haylage, or in a bunker, I would be very cautious because those tend to have a higher ability to produce mycotoxins. And in some cases, they, the molds can produce spores, which can be a problem both to humans and to animals. Any of you that are thinking about selling anything, of course, any kind of mold reduces the value of hay. Here's a picture I've been involved in. A number of people put up hay a little bit too wet. Uh, on the left was some round bales. I wish I'd taken a picture the day before. They simply set out individual bales that obviously were a little bit too wet. Overnight, they got hot enough and they started fire and burn. On the uh, right is the uh, remnants of a barn after, after fire. Um, and, you know, once it gets hot, there isn't too much you can do about it. Here's an <laughs> interesting situation that happened a couple years ago. Uh, a guy hauling hay in a semi, a closed semi, down Interstate 80 in Iowa looked back and saw that his trailer was smoking, and that's never a good move. I don't have, yeah, this is the after picture. Um, he had, I have a picture of it smoking, and then by the time the fire department got there and got it put out, you can see all that was left was a bed. Uh, so, so hay fires can be a problem. And we've seen this in silos as well, on the dry side as well. Uh, some things to think about if we're making hay, the uh, maximum allowable moisture depends on heat transfer conditions. So we can make hay, for example, a little bit wetter in the spring or fall when it's cooler because the heat will dissipate out of the bale and not accumulate and then it will quit producing that heat. The other thing is uh, a smaller bale uh, if, if I have to make some wet hay, uh, particularly with round bales, a lot of us have gone to the five or six di diameter foot diameter bales. Um, if you got a little wet patch, just make a smaller bale, maybe even as small as a three foot diameter. And because you have then more surface area to volume, it won't heat as much. 
And of course, in all cases, uh, if you have some wet bales, particularly bigger bales, leave them set singly versus stacking them. A lot of us do that. We talk about bales sweating or curing for a couple weeks. And what we're really doing is allowing the heating to stop. When we have heating, if we look at uh, energy concentration, if you look at that equation at the top, it's the digestible NFC, non-fibrous carbohydrate, the digestible protein, two and a quarter times fatty acids, and the digestible fiber minus seven for ash. And uh, we've looked at what we call heating degree days. So we've measured temperatures in bales, and then what we do is look at how hot that bale is above air temperature, and then how long. So for example, if a bale is 10 degrees above ambient temperature, which in this study was 86 degrees, then um, we had 10 heating degree days. It was 10 degrees above for two days, we had 20 heating degree days, and so on. So as we look at the accumulation of heating degree days, the more heat you have, you lose digestible protein. But most importantly, if you look at the green line, you lose digestible non-fibrous carbohydrate. And uh, the two of those together mean that we have a reduction in TDN or energy in that forage. It's important to remember the cattle like heat damage hay better just like we do. We like Mallard products. Any of you that have ever grilled a steak and browned a side, you've combined some sugars and protein and, and that browning on the edge of the steak is the same as the process that's occurring in a bale of hay and cattle like it better, but it has less energy. For making hay, an option is to apply preservative. Uh, the important thing is twofold. One is ammonia is a good treatment for grass. Uh, propionic and acetic acid are the only products that work for uh, alfalfa. And if you're going to use the acids, actually the propionic and acetic work for both alfalfa and grass. We'd recommend the buffered forms. The main thing is that with all preservatives, the amount you apply needs to be in proportion to the moisture content of your hay. So or you, you need to know what your moisture content is and apply accordingly. Uh, some of the uh, baling manufacturing companies now have attachments for their machines that will uh, allow you to uh, sense the moisture of the hay and apply in accordance with that moisture. Uh, and that's not a bad technology. The other option is, as one of you in the audience are doing at least, is to wrap bales. And I think there, there's two ways that we look at baleage. One is a hay preservative. In other words, we bale our hay, or we're trying to let our hay get dry enough to bale. We don't want to wrap it if we don't have to. But then if it looks like it's going to rain tonight or tomorrow, we said, well, okay, we'll bale it wet, and then we'll wrap it quick. We, so we can preserve hay below 50% moisture. If we wrap the bales, there's enough respiration, the oxygen is quickly used up, and then the bale is preserved simply because there is no oxygen for the mold to grow. If it's above 50% moisture, then we can have both oxygen exclusion and fermentation like in a bunker tube. There's really no difference in the quality of the two. The main thing is that the acid may be beneficial on feed out if your bale is not going to be consumed within 24 hours. So again, what we're looking at is the wetter the bale is wrapped, the more likely we are to have fermentation. We don't want to go above 70 because then you will get more butyric acid fermentation and you don't like to smell and the cattle don't either and, and won't eat it as well. In my case as well, and I don't know about you, but once we, if we make bales at less than 70, They'll freeze, but not solid, so cattle can eat them. If the bales are something above 70 or 75 percent moisture, then they'll freeze like a block of ice, and the cattle can't even eat them. A couple of things about making baleage. Uh, how fast we wrap is important. And so here is a study that we did. We actually did it, if you look, this is 36 percent moisture and about 68 percent. I'm just showing one graph. 
And um, in one case, we the purple line is where we did not wrap the bale. And what you see is that the temperature went up to 130 degrees and stayed there, falling maybe down to 125 over the next three weeks. So there's a lot of heating going on, a lot of energy loss uh, that could have been made available to animals. Now, uh, the, the zero point here on the left is when we wrap the bale. So some bales we wrapped immediately, which is the red line around the bottom. And you see there the temperature was about 100 when we wrapped it, and uh, it increased to about, uh, it rather, as soon as we wrapped it, the temperature started to fall over the next couple of days and gradually went down to air temperature. The, um, if we waited 24 or 48 hours, you see the yellow and blue lines up there. The temperature in the bale in 24 hours had risen to 130 degrees. Now, as soon as we wrapped it, the temperature started to fall and it gradually went down to uh, air temperature. But um, obviously we'd lost a bunch of energy there. And if we went to 96, uh, that bale had uh, heated to 145 and then, uh, then started to come on down. Um, it actually was pretty close to burning, I would imagine. So the point would be, if you're going to wrap bales, whether it is on the hay end, uh, at the 20, 25, 30% moisture, or whether it's on the 50 plus percent moisture, wrap them as quickly as possible. Uh, the one thing I have done sometimes is to uh, wrap or bale even into a rain if we needed to. You can bale fine in the rain. And uh, then wrap as soon as it quit raining. The wrapping is kind of hard in the rain because if the plastic gets wet, it won't stick to itself but you can wrap overnight or the next morning or whatever. Here's another study that we did, and our recommendation if you're going to wrap baleage is always to use at least six layers of plastic. I'm actually kind of moving up towards eight from what I see in the field. Uh, and the, what, what you see again at the top is that the temperature of the purple unwrapped was about 130 down to 125. Uh, if we put two layers of one mil, uh, you can see that it didn't get as hot, but it stayed at uh, about 105 to 110 for three weeks. If we use three or four wraps, it stayed a little cooler yet, but it was still getting some oxygen through the plastic, and so the temperature stayed above 90. When we wrapped with six or more layers, the temperature, like the previous slide, fell down to air temperature in about seven or eight days, and then stayed at air temperature. So these bales uh, heated initially, used up the oxygen, and then gradually cooled off and came to air temperature. So our recommendation is at least six mils, and that's if you're using good plastic. If you buy cheaper plastic, we think it takes eight or 10 mils because it stretches more and lets more oxygen through. So wrapping is a good process. Square round bales need at least six, maybe eight wraps. Inline wrappers are, are good. Uh, any of you using that? Because uh, you save on plastic about 40%. The main thing is the bales have to be a fairly uniform size. And <clears throat> we'd like a similar density and, and diameter of adjacent bales. This, uh, this tube to the right isn't uh, too bad, but you can see a few of the bales are a little bit bigger than others. It is important to seal the end rows. And I see uh, people do that a number of ways. Some don't seal them and just figure they're gonna lose three or four bales. Uh, some put a bale of dry hay in there and reduce the loss of the next two or three in. Uh, some people are putting the first bale in a bag and then uh, wrapping that bag in as the end of the row to seal and then preserve all bales. The one thing that I do say is that the long lines work best when you're feeding three or four bales a day because when you open it up, even over winter, oxygen does start to move in and you will start to have heating occur. So individually wrap bales if you're only going to feed one or two a day and the tubes are good for three or four or more fed per day. One last thing, um, 
I do recommend a, a pre-cutter or a re-cutter on the front. Uh, most companies have them. I show green, yellow, and red ones here. Uh, they're a little bit higher initial machinery costs. They do uh, have a higher energy requirement and stones can be an issue. On the other hand, if you wrap bales with these, you get greater bale density. So it's uh, good in terms of the, uh, the fermentation process. It's good in terms of being able to store more in the same space. But mostly what we've seen is the next three factors. Um, well, first, one other one. Uh, those people that make bales that are pre-cut, they sure do mix nicer in a TMR mixer rather than bales made of long hay. I do recommend that most machines come to pre-cut to about two to two and three quarter inches. I do recommend taking every other knife out and going with about a four, four and a half inch uh, cut length. Uh, that's about the width of a cow's mouth. Uh, the bales are better, uh, hold their form and so on. But when we do that four inch length, what we find is we get better feed intake. Uh, you, you can imagine uh, an animal at a feed bunk, if she takes a bite of hay and it's four inch length, she can chew it a little bit and swallow it. Whereas if it's longer hay, they have to chew it longer and get the ends to fall off and then chew what's in their mouth. So their feed intake goes up. Because feed intake goes up, we get better animal gain. The other thing is that if any of you are feeding from any bunkers, uh, there's less feeding loss with the cut hay. You know that an animal takes a bite, backs up, chews it, and the droplets on either side of the mouth. If you've got a cradle bunker, it's inside the bunker yet, which is still good. But if you've got a ring or any other kind of bunker, it's outside and gets trampled on and lost. So I wouldn't necessarily go out and buy a new baler on this account, but as I was replacing balers, I would think about getting one with a pre-cutter on the front. So in summary, Cut, I say alfalfa, but all grass hay for high yield and needed quality. A wide swath is optimal. Bale to minimize heating, bale with a cutter. Wrap baleage within 24 hours, less is better. And wrap with at least six layers. The last thing that I want to address quickly with you is um, I hope that you all are putting sulfur on your hay fields. This is something that has changed over the last 15 years. We used to get enough sulfur in the acid rain for our crop, but now that we have generally cleaned up the acid rain, we are not getting enough sulfur on our crops. All forage, whether it is corn, alfalfa, grass, and whether it's hay or silage, doesn't make any difference. All crops remove five pounds per ton dry matter of sulfur. That's silage for that's corn for silage, not corn for grain. Uh, so you can think about what kind of yields you want. Um, you, I'll show you a tissue test in a second, but I think the best thing is to think that for the most part, each of us are going to have to apply about five pounds per ton. A deficiency reduces yield, reduces stand life. Soil test is not accurate. You need a tissue test. So generally what you see in grass or legumes is a little stunting like on the left. You see yellowing like on the left. And um, if your fields are generally yellow, consider that. We do recommend for both um, alfalfa and grasses a tissue test. We'd harvest the four grasses about like we would do a tissue test in wheat. For alfalfa, we take the top, by, I'm sorry, this is metric again, six inches of the top 35 stems. Here is the mineral concentration we'd expect in healthy growing alfalfa and grasses actually, except for uh, the calcium level. So um, I think I'm about out of time, but uh, I threw a number of things at you in terms of starting with high quality hay, wide swath to reduce respiratory losses, handling to maintain the quality of that forage, and then some preservation methods. I, are there any questions or comments? Well, do you have any, jump in.
Okay, so the question was uh, whether there's any data out there on the breaking point for harvest losses, for example, what it would pay to replace your rake. What it would take for what? What, the, what kind of economic loss or what kind of losses, harvest losses, um, do you need to have before you would make a decision like changing your rake? If you identify your rake as being a contributor, would you just look at your uh, leaf loss and try to do some math? What would you do? No, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess the first thing is I would ask each of you to look at your whole system. A lot of us tend to go out and buy machinery piecemeal, and really you should think about how the machinery fits together that you're using. Um, for example, have you shifted uh, from sickle bar mowers to disc mowers? And then uh, what kind of conditioner are you using? I didn't mention this, but a flail is for grasses. A uh, rotary a conditioner would be for alfalfa and clovers. So think about which you're harvesting the more of. Uh, the main thing I will say that I did present, I think reasonably good data on, is that need for a wide swath. I would encourage each of you to ask, are you uh, really putting out a swath that's covering 80 or 90% of your cut area and driving over it? And if you're not doing that, I showed some economic value figures, well, about $57 a ton in terms of quality loss. And I guarantee it's more milk loss than that. Uh, so that's something that I would encourage you to think most about. What can you do to open the deflectors on the back of your mower? As you replace your mowers, can you do something to, uh, make sure you know some of these mowers only you can only widen up to produce a 40 percent swath some can go, go 60 to 80 sometimes you can put deflectors on the back panel to go out to 100 percent i'm presuming most of you have pull tight mowers is that correct yeah. i can see you shake your heads it's pretty neat <laughs> um so you have an option to produce uh wider swaths. Uh, as you know, all mowers are over, have, except with a new model came out this year, have nine foot conditioners on them, whether it's flail or rotary. So whatever your cutter bar with, you're narrowing it down to five uh, to that nine, and then you need to spread it back out if you want a full swath. But I would suggest the first thing is to look at getting a wide swath. That is the single most important factor. The next thing I would address would be to look at the ash content of my hay. If it's over 10%, then maybe you need to change your mowing and or raking practices a little bit. That could be your cutter height on your disc mower. That could be um, the uh, maybe the rake is putting too much dirt into the hay. Your grass hay, which most of you are putting up, should be about 6% ash inside you should be able to put it up with not adding more than 4% dirt. So those are the two things I would start with, a wide swath and ash. So if, And then look at the things that cause that. If a person has a, a, a mower that can't do wide swath, and so their next alternative is a tethered, uh, yeah. in an extreme circumstance, do you ever see people <clears throat> running over the field twice with a tether or, or for example, if rain's coming and they just wanted to get it in, how do you feel about that in a mostly grass system? Sure. Well, um, there are people that that can't get a wide swath and then do use a tether immediately after mowing to spread it out. It works. And especially with grass, you don't have the leaf loss that you do with alfalfa using that tether on the freshly cut forage. The, the only thing to consider then is, is that you have an extra trip across the field, you have extra labor, and again, I would say as you're replacing machinery, think about how you can be more efficient and, and have a machine. But I would say definitely if your mower cannot make a wide swath, the tether is the next best bet. The, the other suggestion would be to try to phase into something different over time. And don't forget the possibility if your machine won't make a wide swath about just putting L-shaped pieces of angle iron as a deflector on the back baffle to help spread it out. Excellent.
Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Dan. And uh, this gives us food for thought. Any last questions before we switch to talking about robots? Well, one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the question was, if you have a, a mix of, we have very little alfalfa for the most part. So if you have a mix of, say, probably Kentucky bluegrass, orchard grass, a little bit of red clover, some white clover, where, what do you think is the happy medium for cutting height in, in that kind of uh, mix? <laughs> so I'd try to keep the orchard grass in because that's going to be higher yielding than your bluegrass. Bluegrass can take a very short height. Orchard grass needs a three and a half to four inch cutting height. So I guess uh, decide if you want to keep the orchard grass in and cut it three and a half to four inches. The clovers, it doesn't make too much difference to cutting height. So decide on which species you want to cut. Uh, the bluegrass and the clovers, you could cut down to an inch and a half or two inches, no problem. Orchard grass needs to be three and a half or four. Great, thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, Dan. Have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you all and have a good day. All right.